Today I'm speaking with Dr. Hannah Valentine. Hannah, you may know that we have begun a number of years ago uh, a project to record the history of um, people who've had a, an impact, a major impact on areas of interest in, in our field. Um, and it's a great uh, pleasure today to talk to you about some of the things that you've been doing in transplantation over the last number of years. Thank you for speaking to me today. Delighted. Thank you for inviting me, Laurie. It's a pleasure. It's a great <laughs> honor. So let's go back to your education. You were born in Gambia in Africa and uh, came to London, I think, at a, quite a young age, didn't yes, you? Yes, that's correct. So my, I grew up in Gambia until the age of 13. Mm -hmm. And my father was appointed as ambassador for Gambia in London in 1964. So the whole family moved there. And there I grew up, went to high school. Uh, university. I went to London University and did an undergraduate degree in biochemistry, which was unusual for that time to do the undergraduate degree before entering medicine. But I had decided that medicine would take far too long. I, I was more interested in getting out rapidly to the workplace and having fun in the swinging 60s in London. <laughs> but of course, within a few years in the other graduate, I realized that medicine food was for me. Can you tell us a little bit about that change in, uh, in direction in your early education from, from basic science, biochemistry, into a, a clinical field? What, what, what drew you into medicine? Well, as I was doing uh, biochemistry, um, it was taught in a very applied way. So in as much as we had a lot of the basic science, we were learning all these important pathways and their relevance to health and disease. The cholesterol pathway was taught in that way. And just at that time, people began to realize the importance of cholesterol in atherosclerosis. Um, my favorite organelle, the mitochondria, I did lots of experiments on it. And people were then beginning to think about how energy balance, imbalance, might be important for, say, in diabetes. So when I came to the end of my undergraduate degree, I, I felt ready for application, even though I loved the basic science. And fortuitously, um, at that time, they were looking for the mature student going into medical school, not just somebody who has you know, gone directly from high school. I think they felt that the mature student would bring a different perspective, uh, it created a more diverse class. And so um, I was very fortunate to be accepted to St. George's Medical School in London, uh, where I started to learn all about medicine and loved it. Having a solid background in um, basic science then, um, not biological so much, but biochemistry, um, how do you think that um, had an impact on your later um, interest in, in research in particular? I think the major thing is once you have, during that period, of the undergraduate degree in a basic science, you learn how to think. You, know, you learn how to ask scientific questions and structure the question in a way that it is answerable. And I think that's what I, uh, I, get, I got mainly for my undergraduate degree. Plus, you learn about mechanism. You learn about pathways. And once you have that solid foundation, when you're doing your clinical, you're always asking the question, well, is it that pathway or is it this pathway? Oh, I've heard about that pathway. It, could that be relevant? And this is the way I continue to think about issues um, in, in managing patients and in advancing the field. So yeah, I think it's rather important, although it does add to the length of time. And that's the dilemma these days, isn't it? Well, I suppose it is. I, but uh, but I think uh, I think what you've said is is very is a, a profound of profound importance as young people train today, um, just as much as it was then. Where there's an imperative to move forward, perhaps, but perhaps um, at a cost of not fully understanding the basic steps that go into the physiology that we then put into applied clinical clinical medicine. Yeah, that's absolutely right. There is a dilemma. And is it is the undergraduate degree that takes up four years in the States and over a quarter of a million dollars, is that really um, what we need to be doing? Is it sustainable? I would argue it's not. And we 
have to be charged with finding different ways of doing this so that at each stage, I'm not just referring to the undergraduate degree, but in subsequent stages that we can shorten the whole process from high school through to the time when one is actually delivering care or doing fundamental research. Because there's another reason why it's imperative is it hugely disadvantages women. So that by the time you're ready to take on a faculty position, for example, there's a collision between the biological time clock and the tenure time clock. And um, it's, it's a huge problem that, that, that requires to be solved. So in one sense, um, I agree with you that the, uh, the, the taking care of patients um, for the pure clinician uh, who, who has no um, particular desire or perhaps not opportunity to be involved in basic biomedical research uh, that we hope will ultimately lead, uh, lead forward um, and bring down frontiers, um, I guess one could argue that maybe the depth of scientific knowledge in, a, in, a, in four years of study of, of science and scientific process, perhaps it isn't so necessary. But for the academic, um, I just wonder whether, just as one example of an area that you're very much involved in the, that, that's topical these days is biomarkers. I mean, we hear all sorts of um, interesting things and we've seen evolution of biomarkers. But I wonder if it's at the cost of, under, of, of not understanding what does, that, what does that biomarker mean? Mm -hmm. What is it reflective of? If we can um, sort of tie our, our horse to something because we want, we want an answer. We want to say, well, if we follow this biomarker, it means it's, it's predictive of this process. And I'm a little worried that we're losing the sense of what is that biomarker? Yes. What, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, your point is well taken that um, there needs to be a basic understanding of biology and physiology. And I would say that anybody going into medicine, regardless if you end up being a clinical clinician or an investigator or a translational scientist, needs a fundamental knowledge. That is for sure. And perhaps even continuing medical education on these issues. But I would argue that, in fact, to, to come up with that shared knowledge, shared understanding, the work has to be done in the context of teams. It is teams that come together that will uncover the important, which biomarkers are important or not. And it is teams that will be able to apply it and test it and see whether it's relevant or not. So right there, we need the clinician who is a player clinician on the team because it is that person that is ultimately going to be applying those biomarkers to their patients. So we need a to and fro feedback. And I think that the nature of scientific inquiry is going to change considerably. So we tend to think about it in these boxes and stages, but I would say that in the future it will be these teams who come together to solve big biomedical problems of human health and disease. It will be the teams who provide the detailed phenotypic characterization of the patients so as to be able the, to make the biomarker work advance. So the answer to your question is that we do need fundamental training in biological sciences for everybody. It probably doesn't need of four years, because I see my own daughters and what they've been doing in four years of education. We could have cut two years out of that without any problem, I can tell you. Um, the first two years are spent basically enjoying themselves. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I think it can be made much more effective. It's a very interesting approach when you have your own children then who come along. Um, my son is also studying biology at the moment. and. Uh, you, you know, you look at what they're studying. Um, so that brings us then back to your other, your other comment about um, how this has an impact, this, this training pathway has a particular impact on women and how it can be disadvantageous of women. What do you think is, how, how do you think we should approach that? Well, I think if you can have flexibility, flexibility along the entire career path, for, and what that will need really is a culture change. 
one that says it is okay to plan your career and talk about your career plans with your team members, with your uh, boss, so that that whole area of not talking about your life aspects and life work integration becomes uh, the norm, so that it's okay. And so that people realize that there are multiple pathways to success, not just the straight tenure track route. And in fact, if you look at everybody's careers, it's a sine wave. There are periods of ups and downs, of variation in how much effort is put towards their family life versus their work life versus the different components in their work life. So we've come up with these ideas that, in fact, everybody should have this career flexibility that allows them to plan and supports them to better integrate life and work. And if it works for faculty, then we can push it down the pipeline and begin to implement it for trainees, medical students. And in this way, I think we are going to end up recruiting and retaining the brightest and best. Because these ideas are not entirely new. They are coming from the bottom up. It's a generational issue. The next generation are not going to work the 24-7 like we did. They are committed to their work, but they also want work-life integration. Men and women want to spend time with their families. The newer generation young uh, man wants to, does not want the kind of relationship he had with his father. He wants something different. And so if we can reconfigure these workplaces to better fit the 20th century, 21st century, then I think we'll be able to recruit and retain the brightest and best, and in so doing, that would advantage women. Then we'll see more women being retained. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have a dis diversity of perspectives, and then we'll be able to more readily solve complex problems. That's the way I think about this. So this is um, a lot of the work that you've done with teams and team, the, the, the structure of teams, I know, over the last number of years. Um, and, and they have a real dynamic of their own, don't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, this is a lot of the work that has come out of my role as the Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Leadership now at the School of Medicine and recognizing that in order to uh, maintain our excellence, um, we really needed greater diversity amongst our faculty and greater ability to work more effectively in teams. And so many of the programs that have structured at Stanford are to do with exactly this issue. How do we create a diverse environment? How do we create an inclusive environment for everybody? How do we overcome biases of different kinds, unconscious or conscious? And overarching all that, how do we work best in teams? What can we understand from the team science literature about team dynamics to make to apply it to solving these huge problems? Transplantation, for example, uh, the work that you're doing. Um, how can we improve survival? How can we improve the quality of life of patients? The answers to those are not going to come from an individual scientist trying to work it out. It's going to be a team, and that team must be heterogeneous to bring the diversity of perspectives to the table. When you speak about diversity, then, it's very interesting because you presumably uh, approach diversity in many different aspects of academic medicine. It's not just gender diversity. It's not just ethnic diversity. Um, what do you think goes into real diversity in, in, in academic medicine and in a team structure? Yes. So from my perspective, diversity must be defined uh, broadly. And the reason it must be defined broadly, I view it as not longer, no longer in just an issue of equity or an issue of affirmative action, but I view it as an imperative for maintaining excellence and uh, innovation in biomedical research and solving human health problems. The route to be successful in that endeavor is through diversity.
And essentially, it's diversity of thought. It boils down to diversity of thought and diversity of perspective, with identity diversity being mere proxies for this diversity of thought. Let me give you an example. So um, we have different kinds of identities, gender, racial, ethnic, uh, sexual uh, orientation, uh, disability, all of those. But each of those brings a different perspective to a problem. And it's by harnessing that different perspective that we can really begin to solve complex problems. And the reason it's imperative, we know that the workforce is now composed 50% of women. And in, in America, it's going to be at least 25% uh, of underrepresented groups. Now, if those groups are not represented in the biomedical research workforce, if those groups are not represented in leadership, then we are going to be lagging behind in our success in biomedical research and our competitive, uh, competitive edge as a nation. So this I, diversity I view as an absolute imperative for excellence. It's gone beyond the issue of affirmative action. From early days, from the first days of organ transplantation, of course, teams were required. How do you see that now feeding back, that, that this new perspective of diversity into the clinical field of transplantation? So actually, I'm so glad you asked me this question because I didn't realize what was happening to me and my perspective when I went into transplant. And it's only in retrospect that I realize where I get this passion for working in teams and my kind of definition of diversity. So when I arrived at Stanford, the first day of first was this meeting, this transplant conference in this room and around the table were cardiologists, surgeons, nurses, social workers, everybody, a huge diverse team. And I think actually cardiac transplantation was one of the very early models of team science and team effectiveness. And it was only Shumway and Stinson and all the originators and Sharon Hunt must have realized very early that in order to solve this complex and challenging issue of keeping patients alive after transplant, it required a team effort. So I think at the heart of this, Cardiac transplantation is the model that has been in place. And when I walked into it, I didn't realize it. And now in, rec in retrospect, I can see how it's really informed my thinking about the importance of teams in, in general. And then coming back to your specific question, I think that going forward, we will need even more diversity of teams to solve the the, the, the issues in transplant, which are not solved. You know, that you brought up one, biomarkers. How can we better manage our patients? More not with non-invasive approaches. Well, who's gonna have those answers? It's not just gonna be cardiac transplant physicians or surgeons, it's going to be engineers. It's going to be uh, big data people. It's gonna be genomic experts. One of the grants that I hold is in collaboration with my bioengineering colleagues, and I know you do the same. It's when we sit together and we ponder these problems together from diverse perspectives that we will come up with solutions. And it's a lot of fun. Oh, it's Intellectually, fun. it's so stimulating, it's isn't it, to, to sit down with the engineers or the chemists? It is fabulous, it is fabulous. It's what drives me and gives me the passion to continue it. In, and in my other field, in the dean's office, I'm sitting with sociologists and psychologists to figure out what are the psychological factors that are hindering the recruitment, retention, and advancement of women in academic medicine. Because it's not just, you know, childcare. I mean, it's much more than that. Yes, yes. Of and course. it's so fascinating to bring these psychological, sociological theories and to figure out these problems. I tease them and say, what you really need is translational so sociology. And they say, what's that? <laughs> sociology is already translational. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, too. If you, uh, if you consider discovery 
to be a continuum, an absolute continuum that starts, uh, well, it's not actually a continuum this way, it's more of a circle yes. because, because it gives rise to continuous questioning. But it, it obviously needs to include uh, um, a perspective or be considered in a context that not only includes basic biomedical uh, leading to clinical, so bench to bedside, but to really have an impact uh, it has to change policy, not just practice, but policy. So as you say, this, the sociology, uh, the economics, the ethics, the legal, um, the context in which we consider health care has to include all those elements of discovery. Absolutely. And I would add two more. Behavior. Human behavior. Behavior of the patients and the physicians. And as you are aware, we have been doing heart biopsies for a long time. We are absolutely addicted to it with little evidence that it's of its importance. But to get people to change their behavior, even in the, in the presence of wonderful evidence that there could be other approaches, is very difficult. So sociologists might help us here. Yes, I think and it right. feeds into economics. And, and legal. And legal. And legal uh, issues as well. Let's go back a little bit to um, when you came to Stanford. So you finished your medical school training. Uh, and for, what, what drew you into cardiology to begin with? Well, I loved procedures, even though um, I had this sort of frenetic approach to things. I loved the basic science. But once I started uh, medicine, I loved uh, procedures. I loved, um, we all had to do all the veni sections, uh, veni punctures. Um, as students, I don't know whether you had yes, the same in, ca did. in Canada. Well, at Tulane in yeah. New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> so we ran around early hours of the morning doing all the bloods and stuff. And I, and I quite liked it. And then I loved putting central lines. Actually, I was headed to becoming an intensive care unit specialist because I loved the excitement there. And you know, after two years, I decided, well, this is pretty intense, and I don't know how long I can do that. Maybe cardiology instead. Uh, and I got the bug for transplantation through one of my senior house officer rotations in nephrology at Guy's Medical uh, School in London. So we had these six-month rotations, and I spent six months on the Guy's renal unit way there, back there in 1980, something like that. Tell us about that. What was yes, that like? It was fabulous. There were three senior house officers who took care of, I would say, 30 patients on the unit. So we were working a one in three. Um, first, you have to take all the bloods, and then you look after the patient. But it was so exciting to see heart, uh, kidney transplant patients return from their transplant the first day. So here were these pale patients. It was before Epigen. They were working around with hemoglobins of five and four. And they'd come back from the OR pink, peeing like a trooper. I mean, it was <laughs> unbelievable. And the skill of the SHO was man manipulating the dopamine and the everything to, to see as much urine as possible come out. I loved that. It was immediate gratification. And, and um, I thought, well, oh, transplant is fun, but not quite the kidney somehow. <laughs> I wasn't drawn to that. And that sort of took me in the direction of uh, transplant of heart transplant, but it was really hard work. Um, one in three, which thank goodness our residents no longer have to do. So i tell you a funny story around that. Um, I had tickets to go and see the Rolling Stones while I was doing this one in three. So I, um, I um, swapped with one of my colleagues and they did one day for me. So I ended up doing 48 hours on call nonstop. So you can imagine the rest of the story was that when I ultimately went to see the Rolling Stones, the next day I fell asleep through the whole thing. Can you imagine? For, the next thing I knew was my friends waking me up, oh, it's time to go. <laughs> so it was hard work being doing one in three. <laughs> but, uh, so you became interested in transplantation from the kidney transplant exactly, route. Exactly, yes. Um, and is, and, uh, but then you did cardiology, mm -hmm. still in the UK. Yes. And when did you decide to go to Stanford? I did my um, uh, what we call registrar positions, uh, which is the equivalent, I guess, of a fellowship position in clinical cardiology. I did that at Hammersmith Royal Postgraduate Medical School and at the Brompton. And um, coming to the end of that, um, a colleague of mine who was just a year ahead of me had spent a year at Stanford, 
uh, working with the transplant team, the heart transplant team, uh, trying to figure out uh, echo diagnosis of rejection. And uh, he had taken the project to a certain degree and said, was I interested? And of course, I jumped at the opportunity, came to Stanford, and I was very fortunate because Liv Hatley, who really was the founder, the mother of echo Doppler cardiology, was doing a sabbatical there. So while I got there, we started working together on diastolic function and the use of the application of Doppler uh, um, technologies to diagnose uh, rejection. And that came a whole slew of papers. And at the end of that, a uh, position became opened and I was offered it. So uh, the purpose of that research was to write my MD thesis, which I did do, and I went back to London and defended it. And, I got a prize for it, but um, but then I never used it. I just came back and rose through the ranks at Stanford. So take us back to when you arrived at Stanford. What was going on? What was the hottest thing going on at that particular year, that point? I mean, um, obviously, echo diagnosis uh, of cardiac function of, of the transplanted heart must have been um, just as you say, beginning then. What was it like? What was it like to work there? It was very exciting. It was very exciting because um, the biopsy procedure had just been in place and the cyclosporin was, uh, had come in in 1980 and I was there in 85. So there was a learning curve about that. Um, there was a question of whether or not to use induction therapy, the RATG stores were running out, and so we started using OKT3. And, but there was always seemed to be quite a bit of clinical rejection of patients in whom you, know, you would rec recognize that the graft wasn't working either clinically or by echo, so that it was a good setting in which to begin to do these echo studies of rejection. And there was always an uncertainty in my mind, at any rate, about you know how good was the biopsy? Was it going to tell you and truly predict rejection? And of course, it wasn't. And, and um, I set up my studies in a prospective way um, to really not necessarily reduce the number of biopsies, but to see whether an additional echo would have predicted rejection. So I was doing these studies, and I, uh, I recruited a very nice um, engineer, a man who had been managed through heart failure with beta blockers, one of the original. And he loved this idea of maybe. He was the patient. He was the patient. He loved the idea of something new rather than biopsies. So we would do his biopsies at the scheduled time interval, and I would do echoes. And when I would make a diagnosis of rejection by echo, I would get an additional biopsy to confirm or refute. And so in this particular patient, I did some more biopsies. And every time I sent him for the biopsy, result came back, no rejection. And he began to tease me, oh, Hannah, your method is no good. You know, it's all, I said, oh, no, we'll see. It's, it actually looks, the heart's getting stiffer, but I don't know. And the story didn't end well. One day, his wife called me. She found him dead in bed. And from that moment, I knew the biopsy was flawed. And thereafter, I started to treat patients with, for rejection when I saw a decline in their cardiac function by echo. And I was regarded as heretic, uh, really, at the time, because not only would I treat them, but I would also I introduce the idea of plasmapheresis. And I would plasma freeze to treat them uh, based on some idea that there might be some circulating immune problem. And many improved. And subsequently, we now know that what I was treating was antibody-mediated rejection. What is, so it's so interesting looking at it from today's perspective when, when we see um, low rates of cellular rejection. So back then, when you first started uh, looking at cardiac function by echo of the transplanted heart, um, it may be interesting to think for young investigators now that the incidence of acute cellular rejection is so much different. Yeah. So you would have had a patient coming back from the operating room and in the early weeks post-transplant, quite a lot of them would have been experiencing 
um, well, at that time we would have thought about acute cellular rejection, but of yes. course now we know that there was an important, there had to have been an important antibody component yes. to it as yes. well. Yes. Which is very different from today, isn't it? Yes, it is very different. The re rejection rates have gone down, and so that's why I said in the context of doing the echo, it was you know very, very useful, so we had that. But even then, um, there was rejection or graft dysfunction that was unexplained by biopsy. And I think that phenomena still exists. And, you know, it's very important to, uh, to think about it and resolve it or move forward. I would love to see a direct comparative study of no biopsy versus biopsy patients and look at the outcomes. It would be very interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. But so you, you say you were viewed uh, as uh, this was heretical. Yeah. T what was that like? T just tell us a little bit about what those meetings must have been like when you said. It was scary. It was scary. Um, um, when I would present on a Friday morning conference with everybody there, I would. Everybody would have been. Everybody with the, the cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, not just one, but several of them, heart failure, post heart transplant, nurses. Uh, study coordinators, uh, uh, social workers, everybody would be there. And I would have to present and say, this patient came in, um, he had um, obvious decreased bio, uh, cardiac function by echo, I did a biopsy, it didn't show rejection, and I admitted him for plasmapheresis. And, you know, um, people would be whispering, oh, she's washing the blood again, she's washing the blood. Yeah. <laughs> and then I took it on myself for calling it blood, I, washing. I said, I admitted him for washing the blood. And I would <laughs> say that. <laughs> and, and now, what is it? I mean, it's a vindication of your early work. It, uh, it is, it is. I mean, it's really um, wonderful to see that now it's, you know, it's accepted. That's what we do. But it was, it's difficult to go against the status quo. And I think the moral of this is to be strong and, um, you know, listen to your, your gut feeling and your, be strong about stating your position in everything. It's not just in patient care. Well, I think that's a very, um, that's a very wise uh, piece of advice. And it's very difficult for a young, early career fellow, trainee, or junior staff member, young staff member, to take a position like that. Right. So I think, though, it, uh, a lot of it is culture. The, the Stanford culture is actually very open and permissive to trying new things. It's an extraordinary feeling there. And um, I hope it has sustained, but it, it felt like at the time that any new idea might be entertained um, and given a chance. Um, provided, you know, it was safe and didn't hurt people and so forth. And certainly that is the message I got and that was what helped me to continue in this, in, in this vein. And um, I hope that culture is similar elsewhere because that's what we need for innovation. We need a culture of creativity. If we don't have a culture of creativity, we won't advance to the next stage. Really. And a culture of creativity needs nurturing by yep. acceptance of new ideas, yep. presumably. Yes. Would you, what words then would you have to, to uh, um, young uh, people entering the field of, of heart transplantation today, people who are just beginning to explore the possibilities for their career, um, and comment a little bit on the role of ISHLT in providing sometimes a forum for the kinds of, of innovative work that you that you were doing then and still are. Yes, um, I would say I would be, I would encourage a new trainee into the field to say that this is a very exciting, unexplored field. The um, opportunities for research, be it at the very basic level, through clinical policy, are wide open, huge opportunities huge opportunities. Um, the opportunity is to work collaboratively in teams. If you feel that you enjoy that kind of thing, if you feel that you enjoy transdisciplinary research, this is the field for you. Um, I would say that you need a mentor, 
You need to explore the field and see which part of it that you like. Find somebody who is in that field, express your interest, and get their support to help you. In fact, my career, this is exactly what happened. I came to Stanford. I had great mentors throughout, and that's why I was able to uh, stick with it. Um, in terms of the society, I think the society has a great place uh, and it's uh, for offering opportunities for youngsters. It creates community. Um, it brings uh, trainees together with faculty, with more senior people. Um, I think the society can begin to think about how to foster collaborative research through teams, through the various um, councils, so that ultimately some of the drivers, the questions that will be um, explored by investigators might actually first come out of teams and groups within the society. I think it's doing a fantastic job in so many areas. In this particular area, as you know, being at the forefront and the driver of research, I think that it could do it more in a team uh, way. They, all of the individuals who do that in their own institutions are here. So it's just a question of getting them together um, and organized in a, in a particular way. Linking them up in ways, facilitating yes. their interactions. Yes. There is one, um, you asked the question going slightly back about what Stanford was like and what the field was like. I don't know if you remember this. Just around in the late 80s was emerging the idea that when a patient received a transplant, in some way they uh, regained some of the characteristics of the donor. Was that something that was discussed in, in Canada? I don't recall that being <laughs> Well, it was actually very topical to the extent that Oprah Winfrey had a show on, on this, and uh, she invited me to attend, but of course, I, I wasn't able to for two reasons. I was given a talk elsewhere, and the second reason, I thought the topic was rather frivolous at the time. But in fact, I think it isn't. So here's my story around that. Day four or five, uh, and arriving at Stanford, I'm doing my echocardiograms religiously on the patients, trying to see whether I can diagnose rejection. And I'm sitting in this darkened room with a patient and the patient's spouse. And uh, after a while, she clears her throat. <clears> and <throat> Dr. Valentine, do you know anything about the donor? I said, no, I don't really. You can ask the nurses. And I was really trying to find the echo window. And a few moments go by, and she, <clears throat> well, Dr. Valentine, since my husband had a transplant, he really loves watermelon. And I said, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It meant nothing to me. And of course, what she was trying to ask me was, was the donor black or African-American? Because there's the stereotype that in the South, apparently, that, that people love watermelon. And I had just arrived from England. I had no idea about this stereotype. <laughs> so I go back to the clinic, and I say to our nurse coordinator, Mrs. Smith is very strange. And I told her the story. And this nurse coordinator actually was from the South. And she said, Hannah, come along with me. There are some things we have to explain to you about this country. <laughs> so there I learned. And I could have told that story on Oprah. But the end of that story, or the next stage of that story, as it turns out, the, um, the woman who won the Nobel Prize for figuring out the olfactory system uh, came to Stanford a few years ago to talk about her work. And it turns out the receptors for the olfactory systems are the uh, soluble HLA. So soluble HLA binds to those receptors absolutely perfectly. So you can imagine soluble HLA coming out of the donor, binding to those olfactory and taste receptors, and maybe not surprising <laughs> that you end up uh, you know, um, loving a particular taste that a donor loved when yes. they were 
the heart was in the in the uh, in the donor. Oh, what a funny story! Wouldn't it be interesting it to do that. I'd love to do that research. It would be so interesting I'd to look at that. I'd love to do that research. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how would you approach that then? You'd find the, <laughs> the well, circulating soluble HLA yeah. and, um, and and link it to those receptors. Yeah. In the well, we've not done very much. There's been a lot of work in the field in soluble HLA and its importance to rejection done by the basic scientists. Right. I remember there was a scientist doing all that work at Stanford, but he never got into the clinical field. I think we should pick it up. <laughs> what a wonderful yeah. idea. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much. Your, your reminiscences and your words of wisdom about team, team uh, dynamics and so on and diversity are, are uh, a real inspiration, and we, I really appreciate you chatting with me today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.